Hello, welcome to the series on pathophysiology in cardiovascular diseases. In this video, we are going to talk about hypertension or high blood pressure. Hypertension is a worldwide problem with significant contribution to morbidity and mortality by influencing many cardiovascular diseases as well as other organ system disorders such as renal failure by various mechanisms. The major aspects of this presentation uh, are hyperlinked in the description of the video below. Let's get into it. By the end of this presentation, you will describe and discuss uh, what is hypertension. You will be able to discuss and differentiate between primary and secondary hypertension. You will be able to describe and discuss the pathophysiology of hypertension and you will also be able to talk about the basic pharmacology of hypertension management. So let's talk about what constitutes hypertension. When does blood pressure get into the REM of hypertension? Systemic arterial hypertension, which we call hypertension for short, is characterized by persistently high blood pressure in the systemic arteries. Blood pressure is commonly expressed in the ratio of the systolic over the diastolic pressures. The blood pressure thresholds that define hypertension depend on the measurement method, which would vary from office setting to clinic to ambulatory to home blood pressure measurements. Regardless, an accepted level of threshold for hypertension diagnosis is a sustained reading of diastolic blood pressure of more than 90 millimeters of mercury and sustained reading of systolic blood pressure of more than 140 millimeters of mercury measured across several non-continuous days at the same time of the day and in the same resting position. The guidelines for hypertension have changed over the years. The second textbook for pharmacology guidelines shown on the left table is derived from the seventh report by the Joint National Committee on Prevention, Detection, Evaluation and Treatment of High Blood Pressure but it has evolved as shown in the 2017 update in the table to the right. An additional comment from the eighth report by the same Joint National Committee um, is discussed on the next slide. Note how prehypertension and elevated categories are different. It is now recognized that optimal blood pressure is even lower than we considered before. These numbers are, are important to you from both this exam uh, or course exam standpoint as well as from your board uh, exams. As per the eighth report by the Joint National Committee on Prevention, Detection, Evaluation and Treatment of High Blood Pressure, in people 60 and older, the goal of blood pressure should be less than 150 systolic and less than 90 diastolic, which in turn reduces the risk of stroke, heart attacks, and hypertensive heart disease. For people under the age of 60 and in any individual with kidney disease or diabetes, the blood pressure goal should be less than 140 systolic and less than 90 diastolic. Hypertensive crisis or hypertensive emergency uh, is uh, a condition or a term that has been used to describe patients with severely elevated blood pressure along with multiple complications from end organ disease with poor prognosis. Uh, 
It is also referred to as malignant hypertension. Today, the term hypertensive crisis is used to describe patients who present with severe BP elevation as noted here. Um, systolic blood pressure greater than 180 millimeters of mercury and diastolic higher than 120 millimeters of mercury. The diagnosis can be further classified as a hypertensive emergency when severe elevation in blood pressure is associated with end organ damage or hypertensive urgency when severe hypertension occurs without it. There are multiple causes of malignant hypertension or hypertensive crisis, including medication non-compliance where patients do not take their blood as uh, their blood pressure medications as prescribed. Uh, renal vascular diseases such as renal artery stenosis. Uh, and uh, certain other conditions like polyarteritis nodosa and Takayasu's arteritis, renal parenchymal disease such as glomerulonephritis, among others, uh, and endocrine uh, disorders, uh, disorders of uh, uh, pediatric cardiac conditions such as co-optation of the aorta uh, and um, uh, cocaine use, other drug use, among several others. Uh, it can also occur from um, CNS damage such as head injury. So when we have central nervous system injuries, uh, that includes uh, strokes uh, such as hemorrhagic strokes. These can all uh, be correlated with a hypertensive crisis. So hypertensive emergencies occur when a relatively rapid rise of BP occurs within a short period. The importance that should be given to hypertension is underscored by its epidemiology. It is the most common non-lethal cardiovascular disease, uh, essentially about uh, essential hypertension, about 31,000 people per year die of direct hypertension versus cardiovascular disease, which kills about 800,000. It affects 29% of adult Americans per 2011 data, which is a little dated. But the important thing is that most of these people are asymptomatic. If left untreated, hypertension will directly damage the renal vasculature and this leads to renal damage and end-stage kidney disease which kills about 46,000 annually. Now uh, compare these numbers with the figures from heart failure which kills uh, about 102,000 people annually and uh, the involvement of the brain in CVA and dementia, which is about 130,000 annually. Only about 52% of the diagnosed population uh, of the United States with hypertension is considered uh, controlled. Now, um, word about hypertensive emergency epidemiology it is relatively uh, less uh, frequent and is associated with certain underlying uh, triggers. Therefore, um, the detailed uh, discussion of uh, hypertensive uh, urgency or, uh, or emergency epidemiology is uh, held for now. A clinical tip for the clinician is that mild to moderate hypertension is not usually symptomatic. This underscores the need for measuring blood pressure at least once in a patient's uh, course of encounter. Hypertension may go undetected for years, especially if a clinician uh, has either not done a blood pressure, but more so usually because a patient has not seen a clinician in years. 
the standard of care for any clinician is to measure blood pressure as a part of systems review and document in the section right after observation in the systems review. An additional consideration that is very important is that a blood pressure measurement in any individual done by a clinician should be repeated for both the upper and lower extremities in at least once in the lifetime of a person, preferably early on in their life. The reason is certain disorders uh, such as the quartation of the aorta in which there is a sharp narrowing of the aorta early on in its origin will cause uh, uh, a normal to increase blood pressure in the upper extremities whereas it will be a lower blood pressure in the lower extremities and this can be uh, picked up in uh, later stages when it might be more dangerous to approach the treatments for that condition. It is therefore important that anybody, especially those with hypertension, should have a blood pressure measurement in the lower extremities performed at least once in their lifetime. Let's consider the pathophysiology of hypertension and Let's consider the factors that contribute to an elevated blood pressure. The control of blood pressure is complex. Blood pressure is determined by the product of cardiac output and the total peripheral resistance and is shown at the bottom of the graphic. It is, however, controlled by baroreceptors and chemoreceptors along with neurohumoral factors which were discussed in physiology. To reiterate, there are many physiologic pathways where abnormal function can result in high blood pressure, many of which share a number of common features. Briefly, this flowchart shows you the neurohumoral mechanisms that come into play when there is reduced blood pressure and how the body seeks to increase this back towards normal, uh, normal. In case of high blood pressure, these processes are reversed to allow for reduction of blood pressure. Pharmacologic therapies target many of the sources of these neurohumoral processes to achieve reduction of blood pressure. There are two main types of hypertension. Approximately 90 to 95 percent of all people with hypertension have no known uh, etiology or cause. These people, uh, or the hypertension in this, these people is called primary or essential hypertension. There are a smaller subgroup of people who have hypertension from disorders such as pheochromocytoma, primary aldosterone, uh, aldosteronism uh, with excess mineral or corticoid activity, uh, among others, which causes uh, hypertension. So therefore, these people with a known cause of hypertension are said to have secondary hypertension. So two main types, primary and secondary. So uh, what causes essential hypertension? We essentially do not know what causes essential hypertension. What we do know is that there are genetic and environmental factors which play a big role. Environmental factors include dietary excess sodium, as seen in packaged and, uh, and canned foods, fast foods, for example, burgers, pizza, and the likes. Also, uh, obesity, stress, uh, alcohol consumption, among others. 
hypertension is often diagnosed well after it is well established because the disease is silent during initial set in period it may go undiagnosed for years which delays treatment and increases mortality and morbidity hypertension is a serious and deadly disease and contributes to many poor outcomes uh, related to morbidity such as strokes and heart attacks unfortunately because it has no initial symptoms and may manifest suddenly by outcomes uh, usually in, in the form of a stroke or similar therefore it is known as the silent killer uh, this slide contains various major complications that hypertension uh, leads to. Remember, when you embark on your studies of stroke in neurology, that unlike what you may believe, stroke is not a neurological disease. Stroke is a neurological outcome of a primary vascular disease, which is hypertension. That is how important it is to respect hypertension as a major disorder and control it early. Let's now um, delve into hypertensive heart disease. Uh, a study of hypertension is not complete without discussion on hypertensive heart disease. Let's take a deeper dive. So regardless of etiology or pathophysiologic mechanisms, hypertension produces a pressure overload on the left ventricle. The left ventricle hypertrophies as a result of sustained hypertension because of having to work harder uh, to push blood into the systemic circulation which has a raised um, uh, resistance to the left ventricle. So as the ventricle attempts to push blood out into the aorta, the high systemic vascular resistance uh, makes the LV or the left ventricular muscle that is work harder uh, to maintain the cardiac output. And therefore, because of the simple process of having to work harder, the left ventricular muscle gradually hypertrophies. This is the origin of hypertensive heart disease. Combined with left ventricular hypertrophy, a combination of uh, diastolic dysfunction, um, the LV becomes stiffer uh, and uh, contributes to the development of hypertensive heart disease um, as the uh, as the left ventr ventricle becomes stiffer and filling becomes more difficult the left atrium behind the ventricle will uh, experience greater uh, loads as it cannot push all the blood into the ventricle this will cause the left atrium to enlarge this will lead to reduction in coronary reserve with impaired oxygen supply and demand. Ultimately, these changes of hypertensive heart disease manifests in the form of ischemic effects and heart failure. Let's now move into a discussion of the pharmacologic management of hypertension. The optimal goals of antihypertensive therapy is to normalize blood pressure during both rest and uh, during exertion and ideally is able to reverse the left ventricular remodeling and cardiac muscle dysfunction. The most common approach is drug therapy. Let's dive a little bit deeper into all the options available for antihypertension uh, therapy. This table summarizes treatment guidelines for hypertension. Treatment of pre-hypertension is optimally lifestyle modifications, which we will discuss next. 
Note the summary of drug guidelines for stage one and stage two hypertension. There, um, uh, this particular table uh, does not, however, address drug guidelines in malignant hypertension. There are many different drug classes that have been employed for hypertension management, and the importance is underscored by the fact that hypertension is responsible for so many cardiovascular diseases such as stroke, heart failure, renal failure, among a host of others. Despite standardized guidelines in drug therapy, individual modifications become very necessary as not all people respond appropriately to every drug category. This large area of pharmacology is heavily dependent on autonomic pharmacology and hence we will review that in a separate lecture after we have reviewed autonomic pharmacology. The, this information will be duplicated for your reference in the pharmacology of hypertension lecture as well where we will also address the management of malignant hypertension. The non-pharmacologic uh, lifestyle management of hypertension are uh, diet, body weight reduction, and regular exercise. In terms of diet, a high sodium diet contributes to water retention that then causes intravascular volume expansion, which is a major contributor to a high blood pressure. A low-fat diet and a diet high in fish oil is often recommended or highly recommended. Uh, reducing alcohol consumption and tobacco must be undertaken. Body weight reduction and regular exercise are the other mainstays for non-pharmacologic management. Exercise is well proven to reduce blood pressure but only when it is sustained and not sporadic. In patients with hypertension, even when they are asymptomatic, exercise capacity is reduced by 15 to 30 percent. The stroke volume increases less than normal and the peak heart rate is lower which leads to a reduced cardiac output. The exercise time and aerobic thresholds are also reduced and may be related to diastolic dysfunction. Medications can help with the resting hypertension but may not be effective for exertional hypertension, um, for example, during isometric exercises. The benefits of exercise have been well established in hypertensive management. Reduction of up to 10 millimeters of mercury has been shown to be feasible for both systolic and diastolic blood pressures with disciplined and regular exercise. The benefit may be significant enough to facilitate discontinuing medication therapy in certain individuals. The biggest possible barrier to the benefit is non-compliance of the patient where exercise is either willfully or circumstantially not regular. We will discuss further medication management in a dedicated review of pharmacology for hypertension. Antihypertensive medications depend heavily on the concepts from autonomic nervous system pharmacology, so the student is well advised to review the physiology of the autonomic nervous system as a prelude foundation to discussion of autonomic uh, and antihypertensive uh, agents. We'll see you again in another presentation. Thank you. Do not forget to like and subscribe to this channel for additional videos concerning acute care and cardiovascular physical therapy.